Um, so last but not least, maybe the best, we have Bernie Sue, um, who's the keynote for today. Um, so I met Bernie uh, when he was working, uh, creating Lizzie Bennett Diaries back in 2010? 12. 12. 2012. Um, and Lizzie Bennett Diaries was uh, one of the case studies that we used to really uh, define or help to explain transmedia storytelling. Um, it also went on to win the first Emmy for uh, a YouTube creation, uh, which is pretty cool. Since then, Bernie has built a company around transmedia storytelling. I don't know if you really like using that term anymore. Deep narrative, deep narratives, world building, moving media stories across different media. There's so many. Um, but just this past year, he released Artificial Next, which he's going to talk about today. Um, if any of you are on Twitch, maybe you've seen this. What's great about it, it was the first use of interactive storytelling on a live streaming channel, Twitch. Uh, and it went on to win the Creative Innovation Award by the Television Academy, an Emmy, uh, a special Emmy Award. And I heard you got the Peabody Award award today, uh, this year, for Future of Media. Um, so give a big shout out to Bernie Sue and welcome him kindly. Thank you. Turn on my mic. All right. Mic on. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Bernie Sue. Um, I talk, generally talk pretty quickly. <laughs> this, this, I, I'm told I have 45 minutes. With 50 minutes of Q&A, I have exactly 45 slides. So uh, we're going to rock on this. Um, so I'm going to actually walk through uh, Lisbon at Diaries as well. Those of you who don't know it, I'm going to walk through Emma Approve. Uh, I, there are some learnings there for those of you who I know who are, say, in media and advertising. And then, of course, artificial. Um, but let's get into it, huh? Uh, we're not. There we go. So um, you use transmedia. I use telling stories across multiple platforms. It's a little more kind of universal as a term. Um, but I have a philosophy behind this, which is making the audience consequential. Because you can do the first without the second, but I like to do the second, especially now. Um, so let's kind of walk through it. The, interact the collective story experience, the, kinda, the theory, the ethos of this, we're at a university, making the audience part of the story experience. Online audiences will expect participation. They want to join the movement of the story. They, click, click. Uh, storytellers need to uh, appeal to the, your generation. Um, to let them voice their opinions, because you guys, we all like voicing opinions. Social media kind of allows us to do that. We're used to that now. So how do you incorporate in the, into storytelling, which is what I'm going to talk about. And in basic terms, do you want to just watch Luke Skywalker fight the Empire, or do you want to join the rebellion and help him? That's the ethos of the difference here, participation, participation and consequentiality in my stories. So we're going to talk about Lizzie Diaries first. Uh, adaptation of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. For those of you who don't know, um, as Aaron mentioned, it won the Emmy, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so 75 million views across YouTube. It still does a million views today on YouTube, even though the show's been over for six years. Uh, so it has that great longevity. Very few things on a disposable platform like YouTube do have that longevity. This one does. Uh, nine and a half hours of total video content. This is uh, the longest version of Pride and Prejudice in history. It's longer than the BBC miniseries. It's longer than the second BBC miniseries. Um, and so nine and a half hours, it is the longest version. We do 160 videos across five YouTube channels to build the world. We use social media profiles. This was very innovative at its time, uh, where the characters, all 13 actors you see there, they play characters. All 13 characters were on at least Twitter. Some were on Tumblr, some were on Facebook. And you could interact with the characters on those platforms. And I'm going to demonstrate that in a few. We had a novelization published by Simon & Schuster, The Secret Diary of Lizzie Bennet. This was the first book based on a web series, based on a book. Kind of cool there. <laughs> we have distribution deals with iTunes, Amazon, Google Play. This is significant to those of you who are entrepreneurs in the space because this is monetization. And it's monetization uh, despite the fact the show is still available for your free on YouTube. People still pay for it um, because they choose to. And uh, those of you wanting for audience, 90% females. Oh, yeah, the screen's up here too. 70% women under 25. Um, those of you who know Jane Austen, does, that should not surprise you, but just in case you want to know. All right, so let's talk about the user experience. Um, when you're talking about creating content online uh, with technology, you have to bring up the user experience. You don't need to think about this when you're doing a movie or a television show because you know what the movie the user experience is. They're going to watch a TV show. They're going to sit in a chair and watch a movie. You don't have to worry about 
the, the user experience there. But online you do, so kind of looking at Lizzie Bennett Diaries, this is what we do here. Go to YouTube, watch a video, pretty plain and simple. At the end, this is where it gets a little different. You have some choices here. Uh, go to the next or previous video, pretty simple stuff. Go to the next or previous video of an alternate character. In this example, the top left, top right, next Lydia, previous Lydia. Different character POV to showcase a different part of the story. Connect to social media profiles, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, and buy merch. So you're giving the audience some choices here. You need to make it easy. I'm not saying this is perfect. I'm saying that this is something you have to think about when you're designing uh, a story experience in these multi-platform uh, settings. Uh, so examples of interactivity. Um, stuff here. Uh, YouTube comments, here's a moment. Uh, the audience can react to this. Daniel Kidder goes, I high five the screen. Because we've designed the story world where Lizzie Bennett, the character, is the uploader of the videos, she can respond in character, bringing Daniel Kidder into this kind of story. Very, very basic stuff there. Simple, simple. Um, over in video, you can do this in video, which we do in a lot of our shows now. Um, question and answers. You've seen this on YouTube, of course, where a YouTuber answers a question that a fan or a commenter asks. Pretty simple stuff. But do you see it with an actual character in scripted form? We do that. We get the quiz questions from Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, and of course, YouTube. Um, she enters in the character. Again, this is not the actor coming out and saying, I am the actor that plays Lizzie. She stays in character and answers the question. And ideally, in uh, success, it reveals character in her plot, like this example. Heather Eskert on Twitter. Are there any guys in your life right now? That is a great question, Heather. So, Lizzie. So you see what happens there. Heather Esquid on Twitter asks the question. That question, we answer the, char uh, the character answers it, and it creates this like, cute moment, uh, revealing some character and or plot. When you do it effectively, you get something like that, and the fans ideally loves, love this stuff. Uh, moving on, social media. This is basic stuff, but you can see the advancement here. Um, Twitter, people who still use Twitter. Uh, this is back in 2013. You see a kind of basically a conversation between two characters on Twitter. The difference between Twitter, of course, than say text messages is that Twitter is public, unless you're uh, privatized all across. But and so a fan can jump in to this, and the fan does. Lizzie Marchese goes, "I need photo proof that you two are going to be doing what you're saying you're doing." So she kind of calls us out, you know, a little, 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 little glib about that, but that's okay because we have this photo ready to go. We actually anticipate this call out by the fan and actually preload this photo ready to go. To both from both characters to the fan, bringing that fan to that conversation. It, it's you think about the, what this means. It's kind of like a magic trick. You're like you know it's fake. You know they're not real characters. But man, it really it really feels real when they respond to you like that in real time. So cool thing you can do there. Uh, examples of this thing span the universe. This is a little gimmicky, but it's kind of it's funny. Hopefully you think it's funny. Um, so Lizzie uh, has a sister named Lydia. She has a cat named Kitty. She, does, she, she announces on the video, hey, go follow the cat on Twitter. Liz, Lydia does her own cat videos. These are actually, this, this video, if you actually watch it, it actually does move the plot forward, hilariously, um, with, through a cat video. Uh, and of course, the cat's on Twitter. We call it out. We have to pay it off. This fake cat has 15,000 Twitter followers. Uh, it's not a real cat. It's a fake cat. Uh, post features of itself, making this just kind of this funny experience. Again, not a real cat. Uh, it's, well, it's a real cat, but that's not the name of the cat. So we had made this account as just kind of this Easter egg that the fans could do. And you can see 15,000 Twitter followers. That's, that's a real number where the fans are like, oh, we're actually going to follow this. We're going to enjoy this experience. Um, and then user-generated content, very popular term in online media. YouTube, of course, a lot of user-generated content. Actually, basically every social media platform is UGC. How do you use UGC to expand story world experience, bringing the audience into this? Here's an example of that. Uh, so, at one point in the story, Lizzie is interning at a company, and a lot of fans, you know, they've used to this question and answers method. They're going, hey, uh, we want to know more about this, quest this company that you're working at, Lizzie. So she goes, all right, I'm going to post the link at the bottom of the screen here, um, and, it it will, and it will, you can learn about more about the company. We track this link, 33,000 clicks across 90,000 views at this screenshot time, which is a 37% click-through rate, which is insane. Um, <laughs> I don't know what gets this. That's insanity. Um, and where does this link go? It goes to a website, a, a website of a company that is fake. We didn't make, <laughs> this is a fake company. It's a real website. But on this website, again, a little world building here. 
you, there's some things to do. There's some things to do. There's a video to watch. There's this little passage to read. And this, this passage actually kind of like cues something. Cal college and column seeks on-camera talent. What this is is like they're looking for hosts. And so uh, when a fan looks at this, they go, wait, can I apply? Can I apply to be a host at this fake company that your this fake character has called out? Yes, you can. Fans do it. Uh, we have to think about like 60 applications. And of course, we've got to pay this off if, we, if, you call, if you do this. So we hire a fan, bring her to set, shoot a video, and that video, of course, went on the website. And thus, this fan is essentially canon um, if you do all this. So one of those cool things you do. Obviously, a lot of work, but in, a, in success, pretty neat and pretty magical. All right, so now we're going to go into theory. We're at a university, so we've got to talk about some theory. So I like to call this parallel storytelling. What this means is that the audience can kind of jump around through the timeline based on where they want to watch the story from what point of view. So uh, let me walk through that. Lizzie Bennett, uh, the character, the, 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 the literal character, her timeline exists on her YouTube channel, her Twitter account, and her Tumblr for 12 months. That's what the 12 represents. That's actually what Pride and Prejudice is. Pride and Prejudice, the book, is pretty much a first person. Well, it just follows her the entire story, the entire way. Um, and that's how that is. So if you want Pride and Prejudice, you just watch this. You get it. You don't have to do anything. It is not required. But if you want to kind of expand and explore, you can watch Lydia, the sister's character's timeline. And in the book and in our show, first four months, she's with Lizzie on the same timeline because they're like literally living together in the same house. But they split off in month four. So what we do is we fill in this gap. So her timeline goes up, where Lizzie goes a different direction, and Lydia drops down here. We fill in the break off again in seven, come back in nine. You can see that uh, there. And for another character, say Gigi Darcy, a character that doesn't, literally, doesn't appear on screen until month 10 of this uh, series, we actually start her Twitter account in month one. So you could actually follow her from the entire timeline from the beginning. What this means from the uh, viewer's perspective is that you have some choices here. You can stay in the top timeline, go all the way down. Then when you're finished, drop down to the second one or drop down to the third. Um, and pick or choose, or you can kind of take whatever you want in real time, like, in, like whatever's the next piece of content on the timeline, cons uh, you consume it. Most of our super fans did it that way, but like someone like, say, my mother, who loves Pride and Prejudice, never actually did any of this other stuff. She just watched the top timeline. Two different, many different perspectives, many different points of view about how you would experience the story, and this is what we present in this show, which I'm sure you guys talk about in your classes. <laughs> uh, so. Revenue streams, those of you who are looking at the entrepreneur side of this thing, you may go like, well, what? that's a lot of work. Does it make more money? Uh, how does Lizzie Bennett Dyers make money? So this is how we did it. Um, advertising, YouTube AdSense, very simple. You show a video on YouTube, it shows an ad. You get a cut of that percentage. Uh, merchandising, very simple things here. Uh, we got things like posters and teacups, uh, and they do pretty well for us. Marketing integration, this is when we incorporate products in the show. I'm going to skip over this because we do it way better in the next show. Um, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, uh, as I mentioned before, VOD. And uh, novelization, now um, a sequel and published in Brazil and Germany. Not going to try reading that. And number six, DVDs. Does a DVD sell for a show that's available free online? I didn't think so. I admit, I was wrong. We, we, and so what we did is we did a Kickstarter to pre-sell this DVD. It's a nine and a half hour box set, as I mentioned. That's not one disc. That's like eight discs. And so that's not a cheap DVD. So we need to raise like $50,000, $60,000 to make this just eat, break even for the fans. So we wanted to sell pre-sell 1,000 DVDs. We were wrong about this. We pre-sold uh, 5,000 DVDs, 6,000 DVDs, and ultimately to set a, at a time Kickstarter record $462,000 for essentially DVDs, uh, 5,800 advanced sets, 7,000 DVDs set to sell to date, um, 7,000 times 60, do the math, uh, pretty simple stuff, making this just a crazy amount of things for, again, a show that's available for free online. It's, this is the result of, you know, you go like, oh, can you just do this? No, you have to build the work and the fandom and the audience in order to incorporate this level of, of uh, fever pitch to be able to do all this. But that's what you can do there, and that's that. Um, my, for me, the money's great, but I'm more about the legacy of the show. This is what I'm most proud of. Uh, inspired many fans to read Pride and Prejudice for many for the very first time. Um, it's uh, studied and analyzed across the world, like I guess literally in this building, which is an honor to be here. <laughs> Dozens of theses have been written about the series. I've actually, I actually met a, a young lady at the film festival yesterday 
who actually wrote her thesis about the show. Again, very, uh, very cool. It won the Emmy. And I think this is the definitive version of Pride and Prejudice for this generation, um, or at least the generation who watched this. Uh, and here's some proof that that's a bold statement. ABC News does a poll. Famous actors behind William Darcy. R. Darcy is beating Colin Firth by 3%, which is crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. All right, moving on. Next show, Emma Approved. Let's just talk, go right into it. Let's talk about it. I know you're hungry. Let's talk about the show. Um, here we go. It, it was uh, based on Emma, which is another Jane Austen book. Pride and Prejudice, successful, us, successful for us. Why not go on, do Emma, which is another sh uh, popular book for, from, the, from the author. 40 million views across YouTube. Less episodes, I'll tell you why in a second. Still the longest version of Emma. Still do the social media profiles thing, but we advance on this, which, is gonna, which I'm gonna skip to, which we do this thing called the five media interactive series. So this is the biggest innovation. I'm gonna walk through what that is, what exactly that looks like, uh, pretty nutsy stuff. Um, and 93% uh, female audience, so we're actually more female now on this show um, as we go on. So the five media series, what does that mean? Uh, it means that you, this is where it gets multi-platform. So video series, okay, we got that, right? But the video series drives to other things, and the other things should ping around in this kind of echo chamber method uh, or world, so it looks like this. So videos drive to this fashion blog, this photo experience. Videos drive to this uh, advice column. Videos drive to this music club, and of course the social media experience. The same thing with same thing with did with Lizzie Bennet Diaries. Uh, Loop replicated here again, but now we've expanded the story world to use it kind of more like a brand. So if you think about it from the marketing side or the advertising side, now you're brand world building instead of just kind of like pinging between two uh, video and social media here. Okay, so um, what does this look like in kind of parallel storytelling experiences? So it's not from character perspectives this time, it's more from like platform or media perspectives this time. Video series, 72 videos, 13, 14 bonus videos, again, 12 months of story. But now we have this fashion blog because we made the character a fashion blogger and we, we connect the, the blogs uh, and the fashion to the stories. Those of you may not care about fashion blogs, and that's okay, you don't have to. But if you do care, you like to know what more, more about what she's wearing, so of course we, we give that to you. Uh, advice column, same thing. Just think of her like an Oprah. Like, what does that mean? Like, like you, can, you can experience Oprah in many different levels. You can experience her from the, the host level, or you can experience her down to the granular, the website, the app level, those type of things. That's the kind of philosophy we're pointing out here in this method. Music club, six original songs, 50 fan covers, and social media destinations um, as before. So this obviously is a ton of work. <laughs> so, but it is something that you can strive for in your franchise and multi-platform story designing to create an experience. By the way, all five of these monetize for us, and I'm gonna explain to you how we do that. How it looks over two weeks, again, parallel, two episodes a week, so 57 through 60 in this case. Notice what the main character, Emma, is wearing. Notice the fashion blog, that companion piece, and you get things like you don't get her shoes in the main show, you get her shoes here, and that's interesting to some people and totally irrelevant to others, and that's okay. Um, and then, of course, the advice column. We actually do some really good world building here where we thematically connect all the subject matter of these advice columns to the thematic subject matter of the conflict of the episode. This is really hard, uh, but we did it. Um, something I really wanted us to do effectively because I felt it would, be, it would synergize um, in a really nice way. And then, um, so yeah, so how the fashion blogs interactive? Pretty simple stuff. Uh, bam, you see the, see, the, see the look, you go to the fashion blog, and you see, the, again, head to toe, but you also see all this text content here, and this isn't sales content. This is like in-character story world stuff, where we said the character of Emma as if she wrote the entire blog in her voice. And like any fashion blogger that you see today, she links to everything, as you're supposed to, because if they're curious, you can click on stuff, and then if a, if a fan wants it, they can buy it, et cetera. So Interactive Music Club, how does the music club work? So this is how it goes. Harriet, the, the, the uh, character, writes a song. We theorize that this would ping around in, in, as, as a loop in interactivity. We give the sheet music away for free. We design this, we just like, compa we, we compile it, we give away for free. We want the fans to do something to it, and the fans do. They'll write a cover for it, as you see their list of covers, and how you cycle, you make the circle, is that you have to have Harriet uh, promote the fan when they do it, which is you know, a pretty natural thing here. But this is a fictional character doing it. So this is all kind of you know, artificial uh, story world building that's happening here. And here's an example of this. Again, the original song. And here's the cover.
So I'm terrible as a musician, so I don't, uh, I've just been told that you can't just take a ukulele arrangement and just like start playing it on a different instrument. You actually have to like translate that to guitar or like flute or whatever it is. Um, so I, I, I do commend the fans who put the time in to do, to do these things. Um, and it was actually kind of fun to, as the songs got harder purposely and the fans would have to like work harder to actually be, you know, do the cover. Uh, so anyway, moving on, uh, driving transactions. So this is where the monetization kind of plays into the advertising, it plays into the, the multimedia, and it actually kind of raises questions about uh, influencer marketing, especially in today's world with the, our influencers paid, you know, the fire Festival and all that stuff. But I'm presenting it to you anyway, because um, we were before it's time. So here's how it works. Uh, so Emma and her fashion blog, all right, so you, you say, oh, you drive transactions for like this top or something. I'm like, yeah, we do. So with one brand, I can't keep the brand unnamed. Um, so we're driving transactions for one partner. So in November of the show, we drove 3,800 clicks and did $10,000 of gross sales for one brand. This is one brand, okay? And uh, we featured many items in that month, okay? So you go like, all right, all right, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and we, of course, get a, we get a cut of this. And so in December of that year, we only featured are doing pretty good numbers here. I mean, like, that's crazy, right? 2,000 clicks and 7,000 gross sales. You're like, wait, from one item, like, how does one item point to 82 sales? And then in, in January of the, of the next, I guess, year, but top of the year, we were on hiatus. So we actually weren't releasing content, but yet we were still driving sales. And so why is that? How is this possible? And it's because the content is evergreen. Uh, the links are still hot. If you come into the show later, just like if you came into a show on television late, you would still, the show is still there, you like on Netflix, you're like, oh, I didn't watch uh, Stranger Things until six months later. Stranger Things is still there. Emma Approve is still there. You can still watch it. You can still look at those links. You can still click on those links. Uh, it's up to, of course, the brand to make sure that item is still stocked. Uh, and then we can still convert those sales. And so that, this just creates a really interesting conversation about like how to make evergreen content yet still drive uh, transactions. I'll let you uh, entrepreneurs uh, you know, think about how to do that. <laughs> and so how do, you buy, how do you do this in kind of integration with product? Uh, Samsung, uh, way back when there was a Gen 1 watch for Samsung, they asked us to integrate the watch into the show. Uh, they paid us for this, of course, and they wanted a video and social integration. We said we could do better than that, um, and we wanted to show off what we could do. So instead of just video and social, we integrated into everything. Uh, so in this example, uh, two characters, he takes a photo from the watch. Kind of silly to have a watch out of the camera, but this one did. So we showed off where that photo goes. So you see, this photo he takes doesn't exist in the show. It only exists on Instagram because that's where it would go. It doesn't make sense for the, show, the photo to appear in the show. It's not necessary to the plot, the main plot. It's an Easter egg for the fans to see, and of course we tag it. In video, this, cam this, this watch can also do video. Again, in hindsight, kind of silly. But we did it, and we featured it. Records a video with the watch, beams the video to her phone. Video appears on Instagram video. Again, the only place in the story world where you can see this video is there. It is not in the main show. Um, before the watch was a tech device, it was a fashion and gift accessory. So a holiday gift guide for the blog. The irony of this gift guide is that the only product that is actually authentic to the character is the watch and the phone. Everything else was completely made up because the character is fiction. Uh, so we had to kind of like fake the rest of this stuff to make this gift guide. And of course, the fashion accessory, which what, what a watch was before it became a tech device, works in the blog perfectly well. And it just you know, seeds right into the, the, the tags, no problem, as if it was anything else. So this makes our, uh, Emma Proves Galaxy Gear integration, a five media integration. It was part of the video series, the uh, fashion blog, the advice column, the social media campaign and the music club, making it one of the, I think, believe this, I'm positive this was the first five million integration. I'm not sure if it's been replicated since, but really proud of this as a entrepreneur and marketer that we managed to pull this one off um, and hopefully inspires you. All right, moving on to the actual thing, <laughs> the most current show, Artificial, on Twitch, the first original sci-fi series for Twitch. Um, and uh, we just wrapped this show a few months ago as Aaron kind of alluded to. Um, it won the Peabody Futures Media Award and the Primetime Emmy this year. Not many shows pull this off. I'm very confident that this is the first digital series to pull off this, this uh, double win in the same calendar year. Um, let's talk about it. So uh, Artificial, uh, those of you who know what Twitch is, is uh, live. So Artificial, we do the show live. It's a sci-fi series that's done live. Um, and it's about Sophie, an artificial intelligence being, 
and her goal is to become human, which is very common in artificial intelligence stories. But the difference for us is because it's on Twitch, she wants the audience's, your audience's help, your help to become human. So now, automatically, the concept of the show makes it participatory from the, the get-go, and now we can do all the crazy bells and whistles to it. Okay, how much content we do? 24 weekly live stream episodes. One hour-ish each, live and audience interactive. So we do the show live, and the audience is interactive. It's not just live, the audience is consequential to the story. Approximately 40, 60 minutes each. Why the fluctuation? Because we don't know how much interactivity is in each episode, so we have that fluctuation of time. Sometimes it's little, sometimes it's a lot, and sometimes that balloons the, the runtime past the hour, um, depending on how, how much the audience is giving us, and so forth. This is not a choose your own adventure narrative. Every person I talk to in Hollywood immediately puts, puts, puts this out. Is it like Bandersnatch on, on, on uh, Netflix? Is it like Goosebumps, those books where you choose your own? No, it's not, because you're all watching the same thing. You don't get to choose something that the person next to you gets to choose something else. You all see the same thing, and so you're all in one story together, just like you're all watching this one keynote. You're all experiencing D3 together. You don't get to, get to have completely wildly different experiences where I like fall off the stage and hear it in one version and I don't in the other. Um, I either fall off the stage or I don't. <laughs> That's it. Um, and I'm going to fall. Anyway, uh, so the audience works as a collective group, so they work together to help her become human, or they can hurt her. There are certainly examples of that in our show where the audience was not positive <laughs> for, for her, and they help her in her journey, as I said before. So um, let's talk about philosophy again, uh, theory, all that good stuff. We're at a school. You love it, or you don't. Who knows? Interactivity is not required. So I've talked a lot about interactivity in this talk, and you may go like, man, this guy must just like, he must be all about interactivity. I'm actually, I'm actually not. I don't, think it's, I don't think it should be required. Now, because we're not a video game. Video games are required, and that's fine. I think that's what differentiates a video game from what we, what we do here, because video games are story too, so they can have story, and they're interactive, but the interactivity is required. Like, if you put the controller down in your game, that, the story's not going anywhere, because the character or the thing you're controlling, isn't hap nothing's happening. So the interactivity is required in the game. The interactivity is not required in our shows. All three of the shows I, I gave an example, you could be someone like my mother, who doesn't do social media. Just watch the show, give me the good experience. That's the way I work. Um, and and you, can, you don't want to punish the viewer who doesn't interact. So you want to watch a good sci-fi show, you watch the show, you don't have to do it live, you can just watch it and replay, you're fine. Being back, watch a great sci-fi series. Um, so then what, why be interactive? Well, you want, you want to reward the interactivity. So you want to kind of like, if the audience does want to lean in, if some people do want to play, they do want to help, you want to reward that with engagement with characters as we did with Liz Van Dyer, as you saw, uh, you can influence a story, which I'm going to demonstrate here. Far more influential impact in this show than the previous two shows, and the audience is consequential. This is my current like soapboxy thesis statement that I think the power of audience is this, that what separates from video games, again, video games are individual. Consequentiality, the audience impacts something uh, together, and we're going to walk through that in this show. So first thing, live audience questions. Very similar to Lizzie Bennett Diary, so not too crazy here. But the, thing, the hardest thing about this one is that we do it live. So we don't get to like, you know, prepare. So audience, these are some of the questions that the audience answered. And I believe all of these as example, and we've answered many more questions than this, were answered by the character as the robot in the show. And so you see some are silly, and some are you know, philosophical, and some are, you know, like, like uh, accusatory and stuff like that. All these things are in play for us, and we just, you know, we pick. Okay, so how is an audience consequential? Here's a kind of a cute example of one, episode four. What do you think of the picture behind you, Sophie? Ah, the blue tree. I like it, but I wish it was purple. <laughs> well, maybe we can do something about that next week. So in this example, God King 52 asks that question. The father character reads the question to her. She responds with that thing you just said. Um, at this point in the story, her favorite color is purple, so she naturally wishes that this picture was changed. In episode five, one week later, literally a week later, we, we flip it so that this picture comes in. Um, and then, you know, consequently, because God King 52 um, mentioned that we should do this. So, very cute stuff. Letters and gifts. Fans can send letters and gifts to the, into the show. We put up this mailbox. So this is physical. This is a more physical thing. Uh, think about like Hunger Games, where they can send stuff into the Hunger Games thing to help a character out. Uh, gift card, um, birthday card, uh, literal gift, 
birthday gift, all playable into this thing. How is this consequential? Here's an example of one, episode 19. Bamadeus one, I hope you enjoyed this journal. May it aid you as you begin to explore the world and continue to learn to express yourself in new and creative ways. So he, he's implying what, he, what she wants her to do here with this. Here's a journal, express yourself in new and creative ways. So, episode 20. So that reminds me, didn't you get a travel journal from your subscriber, Bamadeus, last stream? It is right here. Cool. Father told me to write a poem expressing my feelings visiting the park. Shall I read it? Yeah. So you see that Lama Deus' poem does this, and or her travel journal inspires Sophie, the AI, to write a poem. Very big thematic things in creativity. Um, there, are, if you watch the show, there are examples of this where it like ripples down many episodes and so forth, which I may have on this or not. Let's see. Um, but polls. Let's talk about polls. Um, so with polling, uh, very popular thing on Twitch. Very popular thing in general. Hey, audience, what do you want me to do? Go this and go that. So yeah, we do polling. Um, and but we, for our polls, we make sure we like to make sure when we're doing it right. And I'm, and I'm not saying we always do it right. Um, we make sure the polls are consequential, and because we want the polls to have weight, right? So in this example, I'm going to walk through some consequential polls. What will Sophie's relationship with Dr. May Lin be? This is this female character who's uh, exchanged wife to the male character. And so, should this be a mother or scientist relationship? She's a scientist too, and the audience chose mother. So the audience actually literally gave the character and mother. And we, we had branched this out that we, we had the, exam, the, the answer to the story either way. So the audience had chosen scientists would have changed the show. But now you, you basically establish a relationship between two characters, two primary characters in the show with an audience choice. What should Sophie's interaction with her mother be? Uh, should, it be should she be assertive or direct or obedient? Um, the audience chose assertive. What will Sophie's AI sister be named? This little glowing ball here. Let the audience choose the name. They did. And how should Sophie interact with her sister, uh, empathize, antagonize, you know, sibling rivalry, good sister, bad sister, you know, that type of things. And the audience chooses these things, and thus they are impacting these massively consequential relationships as we go. So here's an example of this uh, of audience choice in consequenti con consequentiality. <laughs> color purple, episode one. What should Sophie's favorite color be? The audience chooses purple, right? Already said this. OK, you go purple. Well, how is that consequential? It's not a big deal. Color's a color, right? No, a favorite color to somebody is pretty consequential, so you have to like start changing things up. Episode four, what book should Sophie read next? Ironically, the color purple wins. Um, I obviously want them to pick Pride and Prejudice, because that would be really easy to write to, if it was me. But they pick color purple, so I'm like, all right, fine. <laughs> Let's pick color purple. Let's go. Um, and so uh, Alice Walker, color purple, keep that in mind. So how does this ripple through the show? You know, books change people, right? A good book changes your outlook on life. It changes your personality, potentially. changes your opinions on things. A Color Purple is a very provocative book. Um, Sophie begins talking back to her father, using language from the novel. Um, the Color Purple has things like, like abuse, and patriarchy, and racism, and uh, feminism. All are kind of themes that you could say you could pull from that text. Uh, and so Sophie starts pulling these themes out. Independence, patriarchy, stuff like that. And she actually uses the book to help her father during a time when he's in need, uh, in denial. And even a, a user at the end sends another Alice Walker book to her. So you see, none of this would have happened if the audience had not picked the color purple. And this affected, like, you know, in this, just this slide show that's affected four episodes right here. And these are massively, uh, again, consequential elements to it. So, um, yes, none of this would happen if the audience had picked Pride and Prejudice. By the way, Pride and Prejudice is a, it, it, the father daughter relationship in that story is very positive. So it would have completely change the show had they picked that show, picked that, uh, that book. All right, so in summary of Artificial, at least so far, scripted serialized sci-fi series, and already crazy enough, uh, live and audience interacted through live questions, gifts and letters, uh, polls, and the audience's consequences to the story. It and I think it defines what a scripted live interactive series can be. First of its kind, of course. Scripted live interactive series. There have been scripted live before, many of those. Um, but there's more. I actually have one more thing to show you here uh, as far as technology. So you ask yourself this question. Those of you, especially who are business people, entrepreneurs, uh, technologists, may ask yourself this question. Does adding interactivity to a scripted series lead to more revenue? Fair question, right? Uh, it's way harder to do this. It's, it's way harder to do it 
live and interactive than it is to just do a sci-fi show with, a, with a, a stagnant story. Super hard. So we, as the creators of the show, ask ourselves this question. And we want to present a hypothesis of how this could be solved. So here's how we did it. <laughs> Monetizing poll system. This is, I tried, not patentable. <laughs> so, but this method is totally viable for anybody in this room to use. Okay. Um, here's some rules that I've determined. Polling, if you do a monetized poll system, the poll has to be highly consequential. It can't be coffee versus tea. That is not consequential. No one cares. Well, maybe you do, but not really. You know what I mean. All right. It has to completely alter relationships and or story, as the polls I showed you on the previous slide do. Okay. And this is how our mechanism works. Each viewer gets one vote, but viewers can buy more votes with, in this case, bits, the Twitch currency. One vote gets you is free, buy more votes, and you can see some of the, the voting. And we've experimented with the, with the thing. Like, is it five bits? Is it 10 bits? This is all experimentation. So this is, this is all data grabbing. We weren't trying to like roll up a million dollars overnight. We were trying to like, OK, what is the most effective way to do this? Right? The mechanism for this, too, is also singular, meaning that if you wanted to put 20 votes in, you would have to do it like coin slots, you know, five bits at a time. You do have to click yes five times. We didn't allow you to like drop in $20 and by 2,000 votes. So you had to do this several times. Um, so here's the example of the monetized poll system in our show. Should Sophie and Lila remain friends? This is like the two girls, you know, they're, they're the best friends. Should they remain friends? We, and there was, there was character conflict to, to, meet, to justify this poll actually hitting the board, right? So we just didn't do it just to do it. We actually established it because of character conflict and Sophie wanting to put this up to the audience to vote for this. Poll goes up. Uh, Lila's losing because Twitch is, Twitch is hateful. <laughs> Lila's losing by double digits. This thing is over. Uh, it's, it, her, the friendship is doomed. Okay, but because this mechanism exists now, the fans, the the, the 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 smaller population of fans that really care about the character can fight back. They can fight for the character they care about, and they love. They can help her now, um, and they, so what they do is they buy extra votes and swing this poll the other way, where she barely wins. Like she's losing by double digits, and she barely wins at the end of this thing. So this is probably just like two people who did this, who like bought like 30 votes and swung the thing, uh, 44. 44 votes to swing this thing. So it's not really a lot of money here, but you can see that two fans basically just did this, right, to swing this the other way. Lila wins, they remain friends. So the audience saved the friendship. So it's, a, you know, it's double benefit. One, we make money. Two, the audience saved the friendship. Um, so the impact of this is, of course, you can kind of tease on what this is. Here it goes. Um, come on. There we go. It's a more robust monetization system. Now you're playing into this gamified experience where the audience can, can influence the show because they just want to, and assuming they have the, the income, of course. Right? Uh, caters to all level users. Again, not required. You want to watch the show? You can still watch the show for free. Just watch the show. But if you want to be involved, you can do more things. And those of you who know mobile gaming, they love to say, don't cap your revenue, don't cap your whales. This is a way to kind of not do that. Sure, there's a cap. right? There's this kind of leaning toward that not, that not capping the revenue for the whales. Um, it rewards passionate fans. I, I, I actually do love this as a storyteller. I, lo I love the idea that I'm giving a passionate fan the power to kind of take over an element of the show that I'm letting them take over. I am letting them take over. It's not they can take over everything, uh, but I am letting them take over, and I think it's really cool because it gives them power. And that thus gives them consequence and agency in my stories. Um, and it suppresses the trolls because the trolls aren't going to do this. The trolls aren't going to you know, blow their money to try to swing a poll, unless they're really trolly, I guess. But uh, the, the, uh, the, the passion of fans are going to theoretically out-suppress the trolls um, in this uh, most of the time. So it kind of allows that thing to happen where the most chaotic answer doesn't always win, um, which is what happens, which will, what will happen on Twitch. If you give them the, the bad answer versus the good answer, the bad answer will always win. Um, and it creates a unique scalable method of interactive storytelling. I really like this method. I want to do it again uh, as soon as possible with other storytelling techniques. But you can't do it with every show. Um, so yeah. And so in this case, like say for this example, um, this fan actually admitted that he bankrolled one character to win a poll, which I think is hilarious. Because um, it's not even close. <laughs> like, like he really made sure that that guy won. Uh, so what's the potential of a live audience interaction? How do you apply this to kind of current media today? Because it's so innovative. It's so far, artificial is so far ahead in that, in a good and bad way. I'm not saying it's all good. I'm saying it's, it's so far ahead that it may be too far ahead. Um, I think it revolutionizes two formats, which is the multicam sitcom and the daily soap opera. 
And why I say that? For two different reasons. Multi-cam sitcoms, if you've ever seen a multi-cam sitcom, it's like one stage and all the cameras are live and there's a live audience and they just don't broadcast it live usually and they don't build interactivity. So you, you can only, you only need to calibrate it, recalibrate like maybe 15% to, to, and pipe it through like a, you know, like a YouTube Live or a Twitch Live and then suddenly you can do the exact same thing but build the audience into the show, which I think is pretty. So we decided to put a mechanism in where we had a doorbell that we would ring if we caught it. And then, <laughs> and then you would go like, oh, someone's in the live stream, go to commercial, and then we could reset, reset it, right? Um, that never, it never happened, but we had the contingency, oh, just so we had it, so that was the thing. The, the hilarious thing that never happened, and I feel like we were tempting like, fate with this, was that we had no contingency if the robot, the actor that plays the robot, sneezed, or, or hiccuped, oh, wow. or coughed. We had no contingency for that. We had no explanation of why. Why didn't we think about this? Like, why didn't we like thematically like why would we? <laughs> so, because because we had story answers for everything. So I'll give you an example. Okay, so right, they're gonna talk about about and sexual and sexual things. Like, yeah, we, we we moderate that stuff. If it gets out of hand, you're blocked. Get out of here. We don't want you in the chat. It's our chat, not your chat. You know, get get out. All right. Um, but we actually. Found, we actually wrote, wrote in an answer to a scientific question, okay? Because in AI humanoid uh, the industry, sex robots is a real thing, okay? That's right. Whether you like it or not, that that's happening. So for us, as right. so thank you. Oh, you're cool. welcome. Oh, we got we still going. It's one forty. Okay, cool. Stop time. We got, we got just two more, two more questions. Two more questions. Uh, so just in regards to like the whole like branching paths thing that you showed us with artificial. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have, like when you would have four paths? Forever, okay. <laughs> and, yes, exactly. You would be very upset about it, as you should be, and thus I should have consequences for it. If I were to physically assault you, I would be arrested, right? Things like that. I'm just, I'm just stating, stating the actual moments of like, why, we, you know, what, if it, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've rationalized why I'm not gonna do that, so it's not gonna happen, okay? But, but see, the, the, the laughter here is like, you, that's you empathizing with the impact of it. Versus it being, oh, I just want to throw the pie. It's like, yeah, of course you want to see them throw the pie in the face, right? The thing for this, I'm just, in, in my, my kind of overall theory and, and soapbox like, point of view, you want them to matter. You want to feel like, as an audience that you're impacting the story. You're helping Luke or hurting Luke because you don't like him. I don't know. Or you're helping Harry Potter or hurting him because you don't like him. I don't know. But like that's what you want to feel like. And today, you don't Potter World, I suppose, because you don't really get to do that. But that's that's the next level of what we can do as storytellers, whether it be in in, in mobile, like massive world online world gaming, um, or in storytelling, or in movies, or in television shows, or whatever. So that's where my work is right now. Last question. Yeah. Oh. Go, let's go, let's go, just go, ask. It's already okay. I just have a quick question. Um, so I'm in the first two web series and um, that you talked about how you integrated almost like product placement. Mm -hmm. I was curious how you would, if you were doing that through artificial, through live, that would be both natural and not forced. You know what I'm saying? Like We could, we just didn't do it because we didn't have the partners mm -hmm. for it. We didn't have the partners on Twitch. Um, we totally could have done it. Uh, it's totally doable and we would have happily done it had the right partners come. But that's something where I go, as a storyteller, I actually enjoy brand integrations. I'm not saying I like watching them. I'm saying I like the challenge of integrating a brand into a story and making the story still feel authentic. Right. Where it doesn't feel gross. Sometimes, like, it's just very cool. Most times they don't. Curious. And that's not necessarily <laughs> the creator's fault. Sometimes the logo, like, put yeah. it up to the camera. And like, really, really, this is what you want to do? <laughs> you know, like, I'm fine with the logos, like, a lot. But this is a natural. <laughs> Why don't you use a natural way? Where I just like I'm wearing a Twitch shirt, you know, like like, like something like that. That's more natural. So um, again, just user. What's best for the user is what this, what's best for the brand. All right. Cool. Now, real last question. Way over here. Oh, all right. I'm gonna get it. Nice. <laughs> okay. Uh, last question. Uh, you had touched upon. You guys had thought about um, the sex doll question. Yeah. As an example, so I'm sure you guys are brainstorming all the questions you can think of, all the types of personalities that are on these storylines, but have you ever come across a question that was asked that you guys didn't have an answer to, and how do you 
prepare yourself for that when you're dealing with these live shows? Sure. Um, uh, one rule is that we don't answer all the questions because there are way too many questions. Okay. So that's one. Second rule we do, this is for all our shows by the way, if a question blows the story open, you can't, you can't, you can't answer it. it, it it's kind of like, let's use Star Wars for example. First, uh, Star Wars Episode Four: Luke Skywalker on uh, you know, at, at, at uh, Tatooine, and it's interactive, and you can go, "Hey, Luke, guess who your father is?" Blow the story, destroy it, <laughs> like right there. So you can't, you you can't do that. You can't, you can't let the audience blow your story. So that's another thing. Um, and so for us, uh, it doesn't mean that those questions are immediately thrown out. A lot of them are, but sometimes what we love to do is see questions that we aren't expecting at all. Like we don't anticipate the question. We, they ask something that's out of the blue, and we go, oh, let's try to incorporate this in. And we'll take some time, quick or not, incorporate the question in, and that's what, that's what makes it great. But if you ever watch Twitch, if you ever watched our shows on Twitch with the replays, that chat is flying. Like, there's no, like, if we were just answering questions, the show would just be answering questions. It would be, there would be no plot. It would just be the robot answering questions the whole time, which would be a gimmick for the real while, but it wouldn't stick and create this uh, relationship with the characters. But that's my recommendation. Close the story, don't answer the question. Move on to the next one. Cool. All right, I think that's it. <laughs>